So my name is Cliff Anderson. I am one of the members of the Wikimedia and Libraries user group uh, on the steering committee. And I hope that Regine Hardiman, who's also on the committee, will be able to join us a bit later in this conversation. Um, this is our second AI salon. And the goal of these salons is to talk about the way in which artificial intelligence is impacting the practice of what we might call wiki librarians. Um, we all rely on Wikipedia in, in various ways. We help to improve it. We connect our metadata to it. We use it to answer reference questions and you know many, many other uses in between. Um, and so we're, we're you know, concerned uh, as a community about um, how AI will help uh, accelerate or perhaps make those processes more difficult or even more biased. So uh, that's what we're talking about in these AI salons. And it's really my honor to be able to introduce uh, someone who I think is well known to the community, Sylvia Gutierrez. Uh, Sylvia is the senior program officer for libraries in the Wikimedia Foundation. And uh, she is here today to talk with us just about um, what she's seeing, you know, in her role across the foundation um, in, in terms of how librarians are thinking about AI and how also uh, maybe to give us a bit of an insider's view about how the foundation is thinking about creating guidelines for responsible AI uh, within the wiki universe. So Sylvia, welcome and thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank you for this invitation and opportunity to talk with others and exchange ideas and yeah, also hear what are the concerns of librarians, wikibrarians um, all over the place. So thank you. So why don't we start off just, I think, on a personal level, because, uh, you know, um, I know that uh, many people will have interacted with you in various contexts, but, you know, I think it'd be interesting to hear a bit about your story of, of how you got to where you are. Um, and so, you know, maybe you could just begin with your own background as a librarian and also as a well-known digital humanist. Um, and so, you know, how did those interests develop? And uh, then I'll, I'll ask you a follow-on about how they brought you to the foundation. <laughs> yeah, great. Well, um, I started first in li linguistics and literature. That was my, my first stop in university. And actually, I was kind of frustrated because I felt, well, what else can connect you with the world if not stories and language? But sadly, I discovered, at least at the university where I, I did my, uh, my bachelor's, that it was kind of like, a, we call it a tower, you know? Um, so this metaphor of we were all talking to each other with, you know, like the classics and so on, but there was not so much to go out there and reach out to the community. And I was really missing that. Um, and for me, you know, being someone from uh, a family of the working class, libraries were always the door to something broader. You know, it's amazing that I was able to be, you know, part of this large conversation from all over the world. So I was looking for something that would bring me closer to libraries. And that actually brought me to the digital humanities because um, in Germany, most of the classes of the, um, digital humanities masters are given by people in archives and libraries and so on, because, you know, librarians have thought for a long time about how to organize knowledge and share it. So I just saw in that program, the perfect fit. And that's how I started in the digital humanities. Actually, um, my master's, uh, my master's thesis was about, um, you know, like, putting into the digital world a book that was written by a librarian on um, literary salons and, you know, how they were making the literary world known to uh, the 19th century Mexico. So, yeah, that was that was me beginning uh, to discover my place in the world. And uh, luckily, when I finished my master's, I was able to uh, work at an academic library in Mexico City, uh, La Biblioteca Daniel Cosío Villegas, uh, from El Colegio de México, um, a university of higher, um, of, yeah, like of 
higher degrees, I guess, like masters and, and PhDs. And it was a wonderful experience. I was there for seven years and mostly doing wiki stuff because that is where my heart was always, you know, like organizing at Tithathons and teaching, um, you know, uh, university teachers how to integrate Wikipedia into the classroom and so on. So, and obviously still doing some digital humanities things. But I want to wrap it there. I don't want to make this a monologue. So please feel free to just ask whatever is important or relevant for this conversation. No, I, I think that's fantastic. And it really att uh, you know, attests to your international background and scope, which is perfect for this role. You're, you just mentioned that you're in, in Bogota right now and um, for Open Access Week. Um, Maybe if you don't mind just sharing a little bit about what you're doing there as well. Sure, sure. So I'm here thanks to Wikimedia Colombia. We're having like a very strong collaboration with with them. Um, Wikimedia Colombia is the national chapter of the affiliates of the Wikimedia Foundation here in Colombia. And they are actually organizing a series of workshops for glam workers. So libraries, archives, and museums. And they invited different people to join the seminar and just teach like different modules. And I was in charge of the metadata one because I'm really into Wikidata. So that was what I, I gave some workshops on how to use Sparkle and uh, how to model certain things in Wikidata, how to propose a property. And this is all in the context of the Open Access Week, which is an international week all over. There are several um, activities in different parts of the world. And here it was organized by Wikimedia Colombia and three different universities, the National University, the Pedagogical University, and the Distrital University. So they were organizing this and it was just amazing. Very engaged librarians. Um, I think in Colombia you will find the species of librarians, which is like activists slash librarians. So they are really going to the Senate and fighting for open access. And yeah, I, I or, you know, like thinking how they can serve better communities that are underserved and so on. So really, really nice to be here. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I've, I've heard that, uh, you know, people say that in, in many ways, Latin America is really leading the open access movement, uh, that it's been most successful there. Um, so um, sounds like a fantastic event. Um, and why don't we why don't we just transition to, you know, your new role, which has it been a year already uh, in, in your new role? Eight months. Eight months. Yeah. So uh, not even a year. So it must have you know, been a, a whirlwind of like, uh, you know, new things that you're learning as you onboard into the foundation and, and take responsibility for um, you know, helping to integrate and, and connect librarians to uh, wiki projects. But maybe if you could just talk a little bit about um, you know, what your role is. And uh, of course, I'd love to hear about some of your experiences as you transition from the, the research library world into uh, working full time for the foundation. Yeah, well, yeah, that was a big jump. <laughs> I mean, I did do a lot of uh, wiki stuff before and also because I was doing my PhD in Germany before joining the foundation, um, I I was collaborating with a, with a network in East Europe, a very strong network on metadata uh, for it's called the bibliographic working group and it's a group of you know the polish national library czech national library and so on so really i was there like trying to see mm, how we can link all this metadata and so on so very wiki in a way and this is when the call was open to to join the wikimedia foundation like is someone there and first i didn't think that was the thing for me but then i received one message from one friend and she was like, look at this, this is for you. And then another message from another friend, like, look at this, you should apply. So I did it. And it was a long uh, process of almost like eight months of interviews and things. But well, finally, I'm here and I'm here uh, mostly, you know, using this digital humanities skills to try to map 
what has happened in the past and not reinvent the wheel. So now I'm looking at this month in Glam, which is the newsletter and when we, where we have all the past collaborations um, with many museums and libraries. Um, I'm looking at DIFF, which is the blog that the Wikimedia Foundation has for, you know, like anyone with a Wikimedia account can share there what they're doing and it's multilingual. So I'm looking at that and I'm looking at the grants. So all the grants that the Wikimedia Foundation has given to advance in wiki work. So looking at those and, um, and yeah, so just to have an idea of what has happened in the past and it has been a very interesting road like i didn't expect for instance that the number one participant uh writing about libraries and diff was japan for instance right so that was very interesting to see and also to learn more about the projects they're doing over there and so on so yeah yeah, it'll be uh, really interesting to hear um, if you you know write a report on what you found, um, just uh, where libraries are actively involved. Um, because I think with the Wikimedia and Libraries User Group, we're also always trying to reach out and make sure that we have good international contacts as well. And um, so that's that would be fantastically useful for us. Absolutely. But let me let me transition at this point to the the main topic of our conversation, which is artificial intelligence and machine learning. Uh, and the way that it intersects with um, the Wiki universe. And uh, I know you have a set of slides and maybe we should just start out with, with your slides and then I think we'll kind of circle back and we'll um, open it up for a wider conversation. But uh, shall I share now? Sure, thank okay, you. Let's, let's do that. Here we go, let's see if this works again. All right, I'm gonna try to put it in slideshow mode. All right, please take it away and I'll just advance when you tell me to. <laughs> Perfect. Well, thank you so much for being here, joining us in this AI and uh, AI salon that is so nicely organized by the, by the Wikimedia and Libraries user group. So um, what I would like to talk about today in the next slide, please, it's just a quick overview. Uh, normally, I have a moment to take the pulse and just, you know, gather some um, thoughts that you have about AI and about the Wikimedia Foundation, but I feel perhaps we will skip that and leave that to the last part. So first I'll do um, a little introduction of what AI um, has meant at the Wikimedia Foundation and the movement. And yeah, let's keep all those slides until where we hit that part of uh, history of AI at the Wikimedia Foundation. Because I'm, I'm guessing that most people that joined this call actually know what the Wikimedia Foundation is. So I'll just take those away. We're an international team working with a huge movement all over the world. And AI is not new. I'll just give some definitions, working definitions. These are not the ultimate definitions, but they are the ones that I'll be using today. So next slide, please. Um, about AI, machine learning, and generative AI. So I will use AI and machine learning in, interchangeably, like I'll use them both. And I know they are not the same, but for the purposes of this talk, I don't think it's that important to do the distinction. But just so we know, like artificial intelligence tends to be defined as a technology that allows machines to simulate human intelligence, right? And perform tasks that traditionally require human cognitive capabilities. And machine learning is like a subset of all the ways you can do AI. So you can define it machine learning, um, and actually I should have added ML and not AA, I have the, <laughs> that's, that, that is the way you do it in Spanish, so sorry about that, so yeah, ML. No, it's good, it's good for us to learn, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's aprendizaje automático, but, um, so machine learning is the development of algorithms that improve task performance through data-driven learning. So data-driven learning and, and generative AI, this is what we're mostly concerned right now when we're talking about AI. So machine learning was already there for a long time, but this is what got us worried um, because 
nothing like generative AI has been able to, you know, perform tasks that were traditionally uh, that traditionally required human cognitive capabilities. So when we talk about generative AI, we're mostly talking about AI that can create data, text, images, music, and other media. Uh, autonomously and creatively. And one of the most common examples when we're talking about Gen AI is conversational AI. So that type of artificial intelligence that is based on large language models, normally um, set as LLMs. Uh, for instance, ChatGPT, right? That's one of the most common um, generative AI examples that we know of. So next slide, please. As I said, um, artificial intelligence, and again, here I use the the um, way we, we say it in Spanish, so EA, but it's actually AI, and AA is ML. So those are some milestones in the Wikimedia movement. Uh, and as you can see, AI has been for a long time in the ecosystem. And one of the first uses was actually um, two bots, and one of them was Clue bot ng, which is perhaps the first bot we had to combat vandalism. Um, and this was in the early 2000s. Uh, we also have Rambot, and um, which was also algorithmic. So it's not the same as the AI of today, but you know it's it's in the DNA of how AI works, right? A machine learning from patterns and then developing a task by those patterns that it, that it learned. Um, then we have something very interesting in 2014. This is another milestone, which is uh, the we, uh, Wikimedia Foundation research team develops the first model of AI-assisted content translation tool. And this made a huge difference. I'm going to talk a little bit more about this because it started in 2004, but it has been fine-tuned over the years. And 2016 is also important in this line because it's when the ORAS models were articulated, um, which are to measure, in a way, article quality. So this is also a big milestone, and we are moving to lift wing, which is on the next part of um, this timeline and it's supposed to be um, you know uh, article quality measurement that is not language agnostic so but anyway um, yeah uh, there's also the machine learning Wikimedia Foundation team which was founded one year after Ortis so 2017 and I draw that line because this moment where, you know, generative AI got super popular, which is 2020, does mark a breakthrough. So this is where we're kind of moving from ML, machine learning, to really like this uh, deep, very intensive type of artificial intelligence that is also very uh, intensive in terms of its its energy use so we can also talk about those problems right uh how it is not that accessible if you don't have huge uh machines to train your data and so on but anyways this is a breakthrough and we have two responses like two other um developments at the wikimedia foundation that are related to this like larger models um which is lift wing and also obviously the the first attempt to interact with uh, generative ai which is the plugging for chat gpt which was meant you know like an experiment more than uh, you know the thing to do just an experiment to understand how our users are interacting with this generative ai and providing uh, a way of showing, uh, of, you know, being compliant with one, with one of our pillars, which is uh, verifiability, right? So that users could have sources of the questions they were doing. So um, next slide, please. Now that you know that um, AI has been there for a while, I would like to tell you a little bit more of how we have been shaping um, how 
our involvement with AI will look like to the future. And um, next slide, please. This is um, the, our guiding principles. And for us, for the Wikimedia Foundation, AI is a tool that can help support our movement in, and its values. And for this, we have like three pillars. So first of all, it needs to be human-led. And what we mean by human-led is that we think that AI can augment and support but not impede or replace human participation um, in growing and improving free knowledge content, which is our main mission, right? So always keeping humans in the loop and properly crediting their contributions is extremely important for us. Um, we want to develop and use AI tools in close consultation with our diverse global contributor community. Um, next one, please. We also think that AI needs to be equitable and that means that we welcome all people to seek, receive, and impart information freely. So we want to build in checks and balances to avoid perpetuating biases. Uh, we want AI that widens the knowledge. Um, I mean, I, we don't want to, to, to widen the gaps, but, you know, actually, AI that is integrating whatever people want to share around the world and we want to lower those barriers so that is actually possible. Um, we don't want AI to keep erasing or excluding histories and perspectives. Um, so that's on the equitable side of it. And finally, we want AI to be transparent. So it needs to align with Wikimedia's principles of transparency and verifiability. So we want to allow humans to understand the source of uh, verify and correct the model outputs. So I'm just gonna share two ex three examples, sorry, of how those three pillars look in practice. So next one, please. Here's one example, so computer aided translation. Um, next, please. So it is human-led. Uh, for us, the tr translation tool is designed to augment, not replace people. And if you have used the tool, actually it's, you know, you can translate the blocks of information from one Wikipedia article to another language. For instance, here you're looking at the colonization of Mars uh, in English and your tra uh, translation into Spanish, but it is, you know, it's helping to translate, but it's not replacing humans. Humans are still meant to edit and, and adapt the information that is being offered by the artificial intelligence. Next, please. It's equitable because it's driven by the community's needs. So this was a tool that was required by the communities, not that. Um, oh, sorry to see you go, Kotepa. Thank you for joining. And um, next, please. And it's transparent because um, translation results and human corrections are publicly available for research, development, and so on. So this is also very important. The, the translation tools that are being developed at the Wikimedia Foundation are not only for Wikipedia projects, or I mean Wikimedia projects, but actually there are models that can be used for other projects. Like we are developing these tools for anyone who wants to adopt them. Um, next one, please. And this is the case of Mint. So Mint is this tool that is based on other people's work, very wiki, and it's helping translate, for instance, articles in Uganda. Actually, the majority, 82 percent uh, of all the articles that are in Uganda, in this in Uganda, so are are being created with the help of Mint and humans, you know, so uh, volunteers. Next one, please. And as we were saying, uh, in order for it to be equitable, we are being responsive of the needs of the volunteers. So Mint is meant to be, yes, used in a desktop. You can use it there. But mostly it's being improved to be something you can use from your phones because we know that the global majority doesn't necessarily have access to a desktop computer. So it's 
meant to work in um, in the phones. And it's actually been many translations are being written on Android devices. Yeah. A second example is uh, how we are improving OCR models for small languages on the internet, not small languages on the world. Many of these languages actually have many, many speakers, but they do not have a representation on the internet. So next, please. Um, again, human led. Um, next, next, next. I'll skip some of this. It's just was it was created by the speakers. Um, this this initiative was, you know, moved by them. Uh, they were the ones who required this. Um, the interface now helps students and communities write their own language, right? Um, and it's, they're uh, training also by writing their own language. They're training better OCR models, and those models are open. Um, and finally, the last example, um, example number three, is you know, being open is not only about opening, you know, the data, opening the models, it's actually opening the knowledge about AI, right? Because it doesn't serve you to have the, you know, the data or the models and if we're not understanding what's happening over there. So we are creating collaborative workshops with the Internet Archive, the British Library, to actually, you know, problematize AI, talk about it, understand what does this model do? How does this work? And so on. So we're creating an open curriculum of how we can teach AI in our GLAM institutions. And, um, and that's pretty much what I'm also doing here. That's going to be a workshop I'm giving tomorrow. In the, uh, no, not tomorrow, sorry, on Monday. Uh, and then we're going to repeat it in the GLAM Wiki conference. And there are also giving this workshop in the AI for LAM Fantastic Futures Conference. So this workshop is being replicated and it's open. So if you want to look at the structure of the workshop and you want to implement it somewhere else, please, uh, next slide, please. I just want to say thank you uh, and take it. You can write an email. Here's also the credits. I really want to give a shout out to Mariana Pinchev, who designed most of the slides for our talk on the Curious Minds sessions. And yep, that's all from my side. And I'm open for <laughs> a discussion. Wonderful. Thank, thank you so much. Um, that was a, a really great overview. And, and you know, I, I think it would be good to just come back to those three pillars, the principles that you laid out, because I think the those are extremely helpful. And I think it's been interesting to see how they apply in these different contexts. Um, so uh, human led, equitable and transparent. Um, one of the things that I think that we, we maybe are a little bit concerned about now uh, as librarians is um, maybe touching on um, one and three, which is I, I think you know, as people experiment with especially generative AI, um, there's a tendency to, you know, go to ChatGPT, type in something, get a paragraph out, and then put it into uh, a Wikipedia article. And I, I, I'm, I'm sure this is happening all the time. Um, and the, the question is, um, it is still being published under, uh, you know, a Wikipedia author's username. That always happens, or an IP address. Um, but it may not be transparent that, that it was actually authored by a machine rather than that user, him or herself. Um, and so I'm, I'm wondering if, if you could comment on that and, you know, um, just maybe lead us through these principles in, in ways that, you know, we could, we could think about uh, how we could experiment ethically uh, and still be, you know, fulfilling these, these pillars. Absolutely. Well, that is a pretty much unresolved issue. It's, as you know, very, very hard to determine if things were created uh, by a machine. Now it's it's getting harder and harder. The are getting so good, you know, like the generative AI is passing all the Turing tests and people can't distinguish, oh, was this really created by AI or not? But we are actually, I mean, there's still a human component, if you want to see it that way. The prompt was created by a human, but we're actually concerned about what the community cares most um, about. So what we have been hearing is that they are not that much concerned with 
things being prompted by a machine, but actually that the results are, you know, that have good sources that are verifiable and so on. So that is something that, that the Wikimedia Foundation is actually putting a lot of interest and a lot of thought in because we are developing models to, you know, check if the reference is actually, you know, given support to the claim being made. And that is the type of things that, as I said, we're developing AI that is responding to the actual concerns of the community. So that is the way we want to go forward and, um, and, you know, and promoting that Wikipedia keeps being edited by users like humans that are, you know, discussing is this you know the right approach is this you know like the right source and so on so keeping that all the programs that uh that many people around the world are developing that is our main goal to keep that <laughs> yeah yeah no, that, that sounds fascinating and you know i think if you get that tool into production uh it'll be extremely interesting to see you know to what extent the um, references in existing Wikipedia articles actually support their arguments. I mean, I think that's an area in which, you know, we're very aware of the idea of, you know, chat GBT hallucinating uh, and inventing references. But, you know, I think it's, it's, a, it's a harder question in, in general to say, like, you know, are these references that are cited on these wiki pages in general, you know, that are authored by humans, really supporting the argument. And I know, Christine is actually, if I can call you out on this, Christine, you, you were working on an article recently, and you were doing that exact thing. You were going through and referencing, looking at all the references and making sure that they really supported uh, what was being said in the article. Do, do you want to say anything about that? That's great. Um, yeah, sure. I um, uh, Actually, I've, I'm a, a part of a couple of uh, wiki projects and uh, in different interests. But um, actually, I'm doing, working on this article right now. It's a, the article about Yuna Kim, the South Korean figure skater. And it was the the one of the major problems is that the sources weren't formatted correctly. And so currently, and it's kind of a big project. I'm going through currently I'm going through the the article and making sure not only are the 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 references formatted correctly, but also if if they actually um, like Cliff said, if they actually um, support the claims that are being made and and i've had to correct reword it and re-paraphrase it um and and those articles i the, some of the articles i tend to work on have that issue quite a lot unfortunately so um it takes a human being coming going back and behind it and making sure that all those things are correct um yeah that, so so it's been uh and the other thing I found with this particular article is mining the sor sources correctly. You know, they're, they, they've they missed out on whole batches of content and information because they haven't included everything from that, from the source into the bio and such. So, um, um, so yeah, that's what I'm working on that right now. Wow, that's super interesting, Christine. And I'm so glad that, you know, like this is this is exactly what librarians are so good at. And I think this is what we like, we're so essential to the world right now at this moment of hallucinations and and you know, like sources being everywhere and people not being able to distinguish is this a good source or a bad one? I mean we got your back, librarians. <laughs> like, I mean, librarians got the back of the world right now. Yeah. Yeah, we are so much needed. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, the, the, one of the other things that, that you mentioned, I think, it, you know, it's it's interesting in this context as well, is that, you know, as Wikimedians, we're used to interacting with bots all the time. Um, you know, that's it's part of our sort of editing process that, you know, I, I know, for example, on Wikidata, when I'm editing, uh, there's a particular bot that will come in and immediately translate, um, you know, the, the, the information I'm giving in, in terms of the, the label into other languages. Um, 
I think it's Mr. Abraham bot, something like that. Um, and I, I love this bot because you know it, it, it jumps right in and notices I've added something and it and it you know makes a helpful addition. And so I you know I think that in some sense, you know the 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 sense of artificial intelligence of you know superhuman intelligence, um, you know that that's a vision that some people have, but others might have a vision that will create bots that are extremely capable at doing particular tasks in in the editorial environment. I think one of the questions, though, I, I would have, and, and Sylvia, I'd be interested in your opinion about this, is, you know, how do we draw the line between, you know, what should be done by a bot, what what is a kind of mundane task that, you know, could be automated, and what really should belong in, in human editors' hands? Um, yeah. And I don't know that we any of us, we probably have intuitions about that, but I don't think there's any kind of red line that says one should fall in one place, the other in the other. And especially as these AIs become more capable, I think it's a question we'll be facing. Yeah, no, I think this is very a very interesting question, and I feel like I I kind of feel like the community is my safety net. I think it is so nice uh, that this question has already happened in the past. So there has already been a bot doing things, and the community pushing back, right? Like saying, no, 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 I don't think the a bot should be doing this. You know, one of the most famous examples is the bot that was just like massively translating. Wikipedia articles into another language and then you know the, the community wasn't happy with those results and they didn't think that was the way to go so yeah okay it's okay if a, a robot d does a draft but not the the actual Wikipedia article so and I think this is going to be something for uh, media studies students or or so uh, even I think librarians to study all the discussions that have been going around uh, bots in the past already you know because this is it can show us where the red line has been drawn in the past right like where is where the communities have said no this is not something that a bot should be doing um so yeah there are some examples already and and the community is very vigilant yeah that that is a great point uh and i hadn't thought about it that way but because you know uh, as these bots are being introduced they're introduced into a community of editors um the editors themselves can make decisions and come to a consensus that's that's really a, a you know a great insight and it's an advantage of of the wikipedia ecosystem because i think in other places you have a group of you know technical experts that are making decisions and trying to anticipate the users um you know, needs maybe do some testing on the side but nothing like the actual environment that we have so a yeah. uh, great advantage there uh, that's a great point um I, I, I want to also come back to ORS um, and and think about the the, the article quality issues. Um, the you know that as you said, and I think your timeline was fantastic. You know, I, I I'm sure that uh, you'll share that, um, and you know, uh, because I think a lot of people could benefit from just thinking about this in that expansive way. Um, but ORS has been around for a while, and if you turn it on, you can see scores for for pages. Um, it, it it seems to be you know pretty effective. Uh, I know that there was a, a system that was also developed to work in tandem with ORS, and I haven't heard as much about it. Uh, it was called Jade, um, and Jade was meant to talk back to ORS. Uh, the idea was that if if you had a disagreement with the way that ORS had rated your page or or you know flagged something as not as developed as it could be, uh, you could explain why using Jade. But I haven't I I haven't seen that as prominently any longer. It may not be running any longer. That is very interesting. I, I do you are you referring to this media wiki extension? I never play with it, but yeah, I, it, yeah. I, I heard about it actually, frankly, at conferences, and so I, I don't know if it was it was you know broadly deployed or not. But I think the idea behind that is is a good one, which is this idea of being able to talk back to AI, um, right? And you know, it, it of course. It, it connects with an area of, of research in AI, which is called um, uh, reinforcement learning through human feedback. Sure. Um, and so I'm wondering if, if there's a way in which, uh, you know, there'll be a, a next version of ORS that, that works more robustly that way, where we say, you know, like, okay, I think this article start class, and then people could say, I agree or I don't agree, and train the model to, to learn to, to, to work better. Yeah, that is absolutely something that is being integrated into the new version, which is Liftwing. So I'm going to share it in the chat just in case folks are interested. Yeah, please do, because I think that's pretty new to most people. 
Yeah, uh, and actually there's the, this, I, I selected the, the, the section because two train wing people in the machine learning team are looking forward to connect with the community. So, you know, humans are part of the loop of this um, way that the, the model is being trained. So, yes, yeah. It, I, I want to make sure that, um, you know, uh, Christian and Christine, um, if you have any questions, uh, you know, I don't want to do all the talking, uh, please feel free to ask questions of Sylvia as well. But if not, I do have a follow-up question. Sure. <laughs> Thank you, Tilda, and thank you, Peter. Okay. Um, well, the, the follow-up question really is, um, you know, in your role at, at the foundation as a program officer, um, you know, what are you seeing in terms of AI literacy as you go out and, and speak with various groups? I think you did a wonderful job of, you know, kind of giving an introduction to AI and then talking about it in context. Uh, but we all know that, you know, the, the field is moving so quickly uh, and there's so many advances taking place. Uh, and I think, you know, we all have only partial understandings of how this all works. Uh, what, what are you seeing in terms of the need for educating the library community uh, so that they understand, you know, what AI is right now? What, and, and, and what AI could be capable of doing in, 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 in the Wikimedia universe? Yeah, absolutely. Great questions, <laughs> Clifford, by the way. Yeah, well, I mean, this is why I also presented the last project that we have. So it's not only about, you know, oh, developing tools that are AI powered, but actually um, learning together. And I think learning the wiki way is the best way for something that is so that is moving so quickly, right? So the idea with the these workshops that we're giving to create like the wiki curriculum on AI is understanding what are the pain points, like what are the things that are uh, most concerning. So for instance, for many librarians, it is that their job might be replaced, uh, you know, because AI can create metadata and so on. But it's also, so if that is the interest, we're creating a series of, you know, Sotero libraries and so and with some readings and how we can also make the point of how the metadata is not to the point to keep training uh, machines to do it because it's it would be super risky because the metadata we have so far hasn't had all the layers that we are currently as librarians working on to decolonize some of the terms, you know, to um, make you know, integrate new knowledge into the metadata, right? Because there's so much knowledge as, as we're talking about, like AI, new stuff uh, that doesn't have like the right metadata tag and so on. So it's like, okay, let's see what are the concerns and trying to create, you know, a conversation around that. On the other side, we are also, you know, because we are also the, the wiki movement, we're part of this uh, great thing um trying to understand what are the things that we can influence right um how can we influence the ai of the future and as we know uh things like chat GPT and so on were mostly trained on wikipedia right and that means that it was trained on a bias like not the most biased but on a bias data set and we don't we, we want the AI of the future to have more people from sub-Saharan Africa, more examples of scientists in other regions, you know, like, so, and we can influence that. We can make the AI of the future better, more multilingual. We know that it doesn't support many, many languages that are, you know, relevant for the majority of the world. We have languages that are spoken by millions millions of people that are not being supported. So um, yeah, that is something that we also want to move forward. Not just like, oh, let's see how to understand AI, but let's see how we can influence AI. So, yep. Great. Um, and uh, Christian, I think you have a question on this. Uh, why don't you go ahead? Thank you, Clifford. And excuse for my my English. I am, I am a librarian from Colombia. And uh, I am so, uh, a follow for the wiki projects so uh, i was i was uh, listening to sylvia and it was great thank you sylvia um, my my question is about and maybe 
maybe it's a question in in a different way, but I and at this moment our libraries in in Latin America or in Colombia, in in our region, uh, has the bibliographic catalog, and in 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 a standard that is um, obsolete, Mark Twenty One. I don't know, you know, you know. Um, but in, in the last year, the Library of Complex launched the bibliographic framework, uh, Bitframe, and this is a, 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 a framework um, that uses linking data for, for, for describe or cataloging the, the resources. So my, my, my question is, is about a Wiki, Wiki, Wiki Foundation, a, is thinking to to make a project about a uh, open catalog using the system using for example Wiki, wikidata wikidata is, is a is a great project uh, in colombia some some librarians uh, are uh, adding um, places authors whatever uh, but i would like to know if wiki foundation is thinking uh, may Maybe I don't know in the future, uh, make a project about a uh, wiki library catalog uh, for us. I don't know. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. Actually, I would um, encourage you to look at the, I'm going to post it in the chat, the wiki project PCC Wikidata pilot. Um, so this is. Um, pilot. It's a working group that is uh, working with. Wikidata and cataloging. And there's a subgroup of them, which is the LCP frame one. Um, I'm gonna link the project as well. So they are looking at ways of mapping mark authority uh, format into Wikidata. So to create those mappings, but also obviously to integrate to BIP, with BIP frame and so on. So and this group um, is norm they normally have their meetings with the LD4 group, LD4 uh, community. So um, let me also link to that. Um, and yeah, they have the LD4 uh, affinity group has their, I think their monthly um, calls or even every two weeks. Um, and yeah, there is the place where they are having this discussions of how to integrate uh, Wikidata to, to, to their workflows and with a very nice results because it's not only that Mark 21 is obsolete, as you said, like also the, sometimes the way we were cataloging languages, indigenous groups, it's not the best, you know? So this is also a space to reimagine uh, and work with the indigenous communities together to create, you know, descriptions that are more accurate. Um, so, and please do reach out to Wikimedia Colombia because Wikimedia Colombia uh, has uh, very good relations with metadata librarians. So they are doing amazing things. And um, I'm sorry I didn't get to meet you. I'm actually in Bogota. Uh, but yes, um, they they are very um, active group uh, working with librarians who are actually, you know, questioning these things. Fantastic. Thank yeah, you so much I, for the question, Christian. Oh, go ahead. Do you have a follow-up? No, no, no. I, I, I know the, the colleagues from Wikimedia Colombia. Ah, Based nice. On David, yeah, yeah. They are colleagues from even some, both of, of their, so they are librarians. So, yes, yes, exactly. Uh, Silvia, um, in this project, in, in this pilot, uh, what will be the, the scope from from Wiki and BitFrame pilots, what be the scope? Well, they are looking at ways to integrate, um, to map the their Mark Twenty One um, 
uh, fields to be frame and also to see what are the points that are um, and they have in common with Wikidata. But I would strongly encourage to contact that group because the PCC Wikidata pilot has many working groups in different places. So uh, I think uh, the London School of Economics is part of the group. Washington is part of the group. So there are many groups. And if Colombia wanted to also be part of the team, you know, that would be nice. And you could also do a spin off in Spanish, right? Like, because many of these conversations are they don't only have the technical barrier for some, but also the language barrier. So, you know, there, there could be a way of connecting and then also starting the conversation in Spanish. I think there are many, many librarians in Latin America, Spain, that would be interested in, in, in working with you on this. Yeah. Thank you, Zibia. You're welcome. Great, so as we round out our time together, um, my last question to you is um, just kind of a, um, one about uh, where you'd like to see us go. And so the, the question is, you know, if if you could invent an AI tool that you could just say, like, I'm going to make AI do this, uh, what kind of tool would you like to invent? It could be really small, it could just be a, a very small bot, or it could be something really big. So, so Sylvia, what, what would your dream be about what AI might accomplish in the Wikimedia okay. universe? Um, I think, you know, uh, being, um, what is it, like, um, aligned with what I said before, um, I think I wouldn't like AI to be an idea that emerge from one person, you know, like from me, like I want AI to be something, you know, the, the tool, I want it to be something that we collectively think that is helping uh, to move us forward in advancing, you know, opening the knowledge in a transparent and an equitable way. So I think that that is for me the, the dream that we see the potential and that we say, okay, like this is this is where we want to go. <laughs> but I'm sorry, it's like vague. It's not the the tool that you were expecting. No, I, I think it's a perfect answer. I think uh, it re really reflects your deep commitment to the community. And um, you know, I think it's um, it's a, it's a vision that we all should live into. That uh, AI is not going to be some kind of overlord, but it's actually going to be helping us to come together better as a community. Yeah, so, I hope so. so. <laughs> so thank you for that. And uh, thank you, Christine and Christian and others who joined us and popped out along the way. We really appreciate this. It's been a wonderful salon. And again, we just really value and appreciate your time. So uh, best wishes as you continue to travel. And uh, we look forward to uh, being in touch again in the future. And we'll have this recording up for other people to see as well. So thanks, everybody. And uh, have a great rest of the day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye. Bye.